everybody. Thanks for joining us today here at Sunnyside Nursery. I'm uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager. Today we're talking perennials and pollinators, one of our favorite subjects around here. We all love the bees, the hummingbirds, the butterflies. So talk perennials and things we can do to help out our uh, pollinator friends today. Say hi to Ben. He's in the background. Hello, everyone. Yeah. And we, we once again have our special guest here today, the Whistling Gardener, Mr. Steve Smith, is back behind the scenes there doing some answering of questions during the class. So thanks, Steve, for coming to help today. So we'll get right into it. I got a slideshow. We're going to show lots of pictures, go through a lot of information today. Uh, as usual, probably information overload, but hopefully we'll give you a nice little uh, kind of gentle introduction to the world of perennials. Um, as a reminder, this class is always recorded, so you can always go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you miss something, want to see a picture, jot down names, uh, it'll be recorded. Hopefully you have the handout, way too long as usual. Nice list of plants, some suggestions here for summertime, um, but we can certainly email that to you, <coughs> excuse me, or you can access it on our website as well uh, to use for reference after the class. Um, I thought we'd real quick just kind of talk you know, three basic definitions, you know, uh, whether you're new gardeners, experienced gardeners, it doesn't really matter. We're hopefully here to help all classifications of gardeners. So uh, the first thing we'll say is a perennial. I want to make sure everybody's clear. Perennials are plants that come back season after season after season. Annuals are things we plant for one year. So petunias, marigolds, you know, we can go on and on. We plant those, we enjoy them from a year, we get frost, and they're done. Perennials are things that we would honestly have as kind of garden companions for lifetime. If we get them in the right spot, the right place, right amount of sun, we'll have a happy perennial for a lifelong in our, in our garden. A uh, temperennial is, a, is a, a term you'll probably see on the sheet and that I'll bring up a couple of times during the slideshow. That's kind of a newer term. We all kind of joke, temper, temperennial, kind of a temperate perennial, um, you know, officially according to the USDA and all the, the powers that be in the plant world, we're zone eight here in Western Washington. I feel a little more comfortable with zone seven, but we'll stick with the uh, the maps as zone eight. We don't get very cold in the winter. We've got a maritime climate. So to me, those temperennials are gonna fall in that zone eight, you know, kind of, kind of a genre of plants, things that if we do get a cold winter, you might lose. So just keep in mind um, some of those temperennials or plants that perhaps we treat as an annual. They're great bloomers. Salvia is one of the huge uh, ones that we utilize here. Uh, you'll see in the show, but those are things maybe we take a little more chance of perhaps losing in the winter if we do get a cold one. The last one, a, a couple plants that we'll talk about today. Foxglove is a real easy example um, of a perennial that, that we would call biennial. So these are things that literally last for two years. I'm doing a class, ma'am. I'm doing a class online. Can you please close the door? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, but biennials are plants that um, live for two seasons. So um, we, we get a, a perennial like foxglove that comes up. We allow it to bloom. It drops its seed. Those plants come up and we keep the generation going. But if we deadhead that biennial, do not let it go to seed. We would only have that plant for two seasons and then we have to plant a new one. So keep that in mind uh, with a couple of things, okay? So I'm going to share my screen here. Give me one second. We'll get the slideshow going. I think we're about to see the dinosaur. I can see the sparks going here. It's starting up. There we go. Okay, so there's me in case you forgot my name already, but we're going to show you a few things and talk some tips here. In a second, I'm going to have to move. So if we look at, um, again, some basics on perennials, you know, again, these are plants that come back year after year after year when planted in the proper sun and soil locations. We want to make sure we've got the right plant in the right place. We've got a happy perennial. If we don't, then perhaps we get too wet in the winter. There's a lot of other issues that, that we may lose that plant, but feasibly the perennial we should have again for a lifetime. Always look at your sun locations. Do I have full sun, hard sun, morning sun, afternoon sun, shade? A lot of different situations we can have in the garden. I would always consider myself full sun, obviously to be all day sun or all afternoon sun in the hot part of the day. 
the part sun, part shade thing to me would be more morning sun. And then if we get into those shady situations where maybe a little bit of morning, a little bit late in the day, or kind of that dappled light is as we go through the, the middle of the day, those are all situations we could enjoy that, that shade to part shade. So pay attention to the plants um, and they'll tell you right on our labels here where, where the best place to grow them is. You know, to me, drainage is always a huge thing in Washington. We're having a, a record heat summer. It's been very dry, you know, being here my whole life. I can't believe how dry it is this summer and how warm, um, but we still are gonna have wet winters. I mean, that is not gonna change. The rain starts in the fall. We're known as kind of the gray climate here over the winter, which I love, but we have to make sure that water table does not come up and get into the root systems of a lot of perennials. We have to have good drainage. We can't dig a hole, have hard pan clay a foot down, pop a lavender on top of it and expect a lavender to grow for years. We need to make sure that water, especially in the wintertime, has a place to drain through. Um, you know, one big thing with perennials, you know, again, your gardening taste may not be the same as mine. We all like a little different things, but, you know, look at perennials in two main groups. Am I going to buy something that clumps and stays maybe a little tidier and, and, and creeps a little bit every year? Or do I want something that'll naturalize? Maybe I plant one or two or three that spends a root system and covers maybe a larger area. There's certainly places for both in the garden and certainly according to your taste, you know, you would pick the right one for you. You know, pay attention to some plants that need staking and support. You know, we, we typically have very wet springs. Things are gonna put on a lot of growth. Am I gonna get something up two, three, four feet especially when they start to bloom, that's going to flop, you know, on a wet day later in spring or early summer. Do I need to give it a support, a cage, a growth through ring? Uh, there's a lot of good options for uh, staking perennials that aren't really unsightly in the garden. I use a lot of a Cortan, you know, rusty metal. I kind of like the rustic chic in my yard. You, you may like something that's powder coated or bright or black or green. I mean, there's a lot of options um, on stakes and, and how to support some of these plants. Um, always look at deadheading, the second thing there. You know, perennials um, are, you know, all plants really, but it, it, today we're talking perennials are gonna wanna bloom, go to seed and try to reproduce themselves. That's the nature of, of all creatures. We wanna, we wanna reproduce, I want more of me. So if we let those, the first blooms on a lot of these summer perennials dry and go to seed, that may they may that may inhibit us a little bit of uh, reblooming over the summer, so I will tend to spend a, a lot of time, you know, in the mid June July time frame, doing a little bit of deadheading on things as the blooms dry, so that I can keep growth coming up and get repeat flowering on a, on a vast majority of our perennials, um, really all summer long. You know, there's a bunch that we'll talk about today that I could feasibly have flowers on, you know, June all the way till frost if I do a little bit of deadheading. And, and keep them fed. You know, look at drought tolerance is the next thing on there. You know, again, we're having a dry summer, but we typically do have more of a Mediterranean summertime here. You know, wet eight, nine months with pretty regular rain off and on and three months of dry, you know, pretty much every summer. So if you're planting those hot spots, slopes, you know, areas you don't water much, look for drought tolerance. There's a lot of great options for drought tolerant perennials for both sun and shade. If we water these things, get them established for a couple seasons, these are plants that we can come close to walking away from long-term. We don't have to do a lot of, a lot of long-term once they're, once they're established. Again, there's the first time you'll see that word considered temperennials. You know, again, I mentioned salvia. You know, my hummingbird would be upset at me if I did not plant my big black and blue or Amistad salvia in the container in my driveway. Um, I treat it as an annual, maybe once in, a few years, oh wow, look at that, it came back in springtime, but I treat that as an annual. I'm gonna get more flower power out of some of those temperennials like salvias that I can enjoy, the pollinators are happy with. Um, and then if I have to throw it away in the fall, great. You know, I put some winter stuff in and then I replant that salvia again the next May to enjoy for another summer, okay? Um, and then again, help out the bees and plant some of these. You know, we're, we're gonna, Spend a lot of time today showing plants and things that are obviously going to make our pollinating partners happy in the garden. Um, but that's kind of a great perennial motto that we use around here, you know, help out the bees and plant some of these. That, that has a nice rhyme to it too. Um, you know, where to plant perennials in the garden? You know, I'm always looking along borders. There's a, 
a vast array you'll see here. I, th I think we do a great job at Sunnyside organizing our perennials by height or by use. So you're gonna see low tables, medium tables, tall tables. Depending on the plant we choose, we can pick the appropriate spot in the garden for it. But typically, you know, a lot of the perennials are for along garden borders. You know, I want something to pop. I've got structure, I've got shrubs. I wanna add some perennials along the border or mix them in with those shrubs if they're a little taller um, that I can view and, and enjoy again, season to season to season. You know, you'll hear that word mass, you know, sometimes, you know, putting one of something in is appropriate. I think with a lot of perennials, you know, buying three or five, you know, creating a nice border of them will fill the garden in a little quicker. And again, give you more of that natural look where, um, where you're allowing those things to naturalize more in masses. You know, with all garden design, that next point here, we, you know, we try to talk about the layered look. You know, we, we have height in the back, we move down, and then we have border plants on the edge. You'll always get to me go right if you think of the garden in layers like that. And where do I add those perennials as a low border plant, maybe in the middle of the border, if I have a little bit more height, but you can to me have a sharp looking yard by looking at your height of these different perennials and, and getting them into the right spot. So you've got that layered look. You know, always use compost um, when planting. You know, we, whether we dig the small hole and you've got great drainage, I would always mix a third compost with two thirds of my native soil when I pop it in the ground and use a really good organic transplanter. You know, we use SureStart here. We go through hundreds and hundreds of pouches of that. You know, that's plant insurance. That's happy gardening. That's great success for you. If you can get the fertilizer, get the soil in, you're gonna have happy perennials long-term. Now, a couple times, you know, kind of as we go through the season here, you know, if we're gonna do this as a perennial class, we'll touch a little bit on this in the fall as well with our fall perennial class. But consider, you know, the, 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 the perennials I'll show you here as sticks, mushers, and evergreen. Those are three kind of main classes that I would consider. You know, it kind of sounds funny, but if, if we, you know, think of a stick, you know, what happens after the season? We get frost, those perennials go dormant, the roots are still alive and we'll see you next year. But do I have a little bit of a woody stem left out of the ground? Maybe a cone flower, rudbeckia, a lot of different plants I would call sticks where I could walk out in the winter, cut that back after we get frost. But sometimes with me, I'll leave that little stick to remind me, I'll see you again next year and I won't step on you this winter if I'm in there gardening a little bit. Um, so think of some as sticks. Others, mushers, you know, not to use a bad analogy, but think of that perennial that kind of melts into a slimy snot mass, you know, after we get frost in the fall. Not gross, but think of the hosta. You know, we get a frost, they go dormant to the ground. I can almost grab my head, glove hand and just scrape that off the ground, add it to the yard waste. And again, we'll see you next year. A few at the end we'll show you would be evergreen. So now, I've got a perennial that would keep its foliage year round. Maybe I started over once a year on purpose, but those are plants that I would have some presence even in the winter time, um, showing a little bit of evergreen foliage, okay? Now, if you wanna follow my, you know, my formula on feeding, um, we've really got two options. And at the end after the show, I'll show you a couple fertilizers, but I would always at least go out in that early March timeframe. <coughs> and then perhaps once again in early summer, and those are the times I would add a good organic uh, rose and flower fertilizer. We carry EB Stone Organics here, fabulous fertilizer. I've always got a bag of that in my garage. And if I've got a perennial, I can take my compost or mulch, scrape it away, put a nice rim of fertilizer around the edge of that and put the compost right back over the top. Or if I haven't mulched, add some compost as kind of a nice buffering layer, lock the fertilizer down, keep my plant happy that season again. The other option is we use something water soluble. You know, here at the nursery, uh, we use a great kind of hybrid synthetic organic product called Seagro. So we will use an injection system. It's a water soluble and we can put that on all our plants once a week. You know, we feed all of our annuals, we feed our perennials um, once a week going that route. You could do the same thing in your yard. Maybe it's not once a week, but I would think every two weeks or even every month would be a really nice foliar feed that you can keep the, the foliage looking great and keep the flowers coming as we go through the, the heat of the summer. Um, you know, clean up in the fall, you know, is the one time of year, you know, the evergreen ones, maybe we leave those alone. Um, 
but for all, we want to clean these up. You know, I tend to watch for me things that are perhaps slug prone. I don't want debris sitting over that crown where slugs have a chance to lay eggs over winter and start eating away come the next springtime. So maybe I don't clean up all my perennial debris, but I'll watch for certain things that I know might be prone to slugs and make sure I've got the debris in that crown nice and clear so I don't have slugs um, laying eggs over the winter time. So, you know, it's kind of always a, a fine line between, you know, OCD, me, and uh, Al Natural. You know, we like some leaf cover. We like the mulch in the winter. I certainly am not going to going to come down on you if you want to leave your debris on the ground then maybe we clean that up a bit in spring uh, but certainly in fall I would consider maybe a few plants that maybe we had some slug issues or bug issues that we do clean those up in the fall before winter time and then you can see you know again slugs are always the big thing here in western Washington especially probably in shade gardens um, you know don't have to get murder death kill poison you know look for sluggo products that's all we carry here at our nursery nice organic safe for pets, kids, wildlife, people, all that business, but very effective as a, as a slug bait as well, okay? So pollinators, you know, if I just gave you kind of three reasons why I would consider, you know, going to help out the pollinators in the yard, you know, to me, it's always about the local ecosystem. You know, we have a nice mix of plants in our gardens. Um, pollinators are gonna provide the nectar, the pollen, some seeds, you know, keep the birds, the bees, other pollinators, butterflies, hummingbirds, all those creatures happy here as we go through the season. I mean, we can almost find something that's blooming in our climate year round or different plants for different times of the year that would keep um, our pollinator friends happy in our own gardens. Um, a huge thing is gonna be going organic. You know, if you come to my classes, whether it's the fruit tree class back in January or anything in the fall, you know, I'm always kind of preaching about trying to go green as best you can organic fertilizers, and most importantly, organic sprays. Um, the biggest two things that are gonna bother the pollinators in the garden are using things that are systemic and neonics or neonics, you can pronounce it however you want to, but that classification of uh, pesticides are gradually getting, I think, weeded out of, of, of home garden use anyway. But those are the two things to avoid. You know, If you wanna keep your bees and, and all those creatures happy, stay away from systemics and, 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 and neonics would be the other classification to stay away. We've got great organic natural products that we can take care of diseases, bugs, everything in between here at the nursery. Come down and, and we'll show you. Um, and then the last thing there is plant for diversity. You know, we want the hummingbird hanging out in the winter. Yes, we can, we can add a sugar feeder and, and keep, them, keep them fed, but hummingbirds need protein over the winter. They like to eat bugs on the ground. I mean, there's a lot of other reasons besides just having nectar to keep that hummingbird happy 12 months of the year. So look at all your, you know, the plethora of plants you could choose from. I mean, there's things again that we can have for winter, spring, summer, fall uh, to keep the pollinators um, and, and, and our nectar lovers happy, okay? So let's go through and look at some plants. Let me see what I'm doing on time here. I'm doing great today. Um, we're gonna show you quite a few of plants here, some pictures. Most of these we still have in stock at the nursery, multiple varieties, multiple colors. This doesn't mean it's the only one, um, but just to kind of give you a quick overview of some things that I would think about for summer in specific. Again, because it's kind of a summer class, so more of things that would bloom over the summertime. First one there, you know, Agastache, Agastache. I've heard it pronounced eight different ways. We can call it hyssop, we can call it hummingbird mint. You can call it whatever you like, but that's one I have in my butterfly garden. Great nectar source, all kinds of color options, a uh, very drought tolerance, got fragrant foliage, um, and a few different heights available. That's one that we can get some great dwarf ones now, or also get some 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 taller varieties if we want to use them a little bit farther back off the border. But uh, Agastache will give you a whole summer bloom all the way till a uh, frost, and if we have good drainage, that's a really good reliable perennial uh, for good sunny, hot, dry areas. Everybody's into Asclepius these days, butterfly weed, butterfly flower, you can call it what you like. No, we do not get monarch butterflies up here. Everybody wants to feed the monarchs. They're not quite farthest north yet, probably with global warming pretty close. But uh, we do have a lot of great native butterfly species to our area. And, you know, anything with nectar, with bright flower, we're going to help out those pollinators. And Asclepius uh, certainly fits that bill. A number of different options for, uh, for butterfly weed. 
uh, asters are coming on here for the for the late summer fall. The first asters are starting to bud up right now. This is a August, September, October. You know, getting into the the fall months. Lots of different options for asters. That's a bee favorite. Really heavy bloom on a lot of on a lot of the varieties of asters for that sun, that part shade location. I think everybody's familiar with echinacea these days or cone flowers. Um, I could have probably put uh, 200 pictures of different code flowers in the slideshow alone. So I just picked one to show you what they look like. But I could pick any color in the rainbow essentially for, for cone flower these days. We've got all kinds of heights, low ones, compact ones. Uh, most of these, if we do a little early deadheading, will extend my bloom time a little bit. But cone flower is a great one for the pollinators, for drought tolerance, hot sun. This is one that, again, I would consider massing. I tend to buy three of one and put them in a nice little mass so it makes a statement as they bloom. Um, but if you're like me and you like your hot colors, uh, lots of oranges and reds and bright yellows available, but also pinks, a little bit towards purple and some pastel colors, whites. You know, we can do white coneflower as well. Uh, Coreopsis, some people call that tick seed. Lots of options for that. That's another one, long season of flower, great for the pollinators, a nice, hot, sunny, dry one. Uh, that's a, most of our customers um, would plant multiple of these. That's another one that will naturalize very well. Um, so I'd consider getting a few of those. If again, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, there are some pink ones, um, but some fun flowers. You come down and look at, at Coreopsis, there's quite a few options um, of, of some good ones. Again, low, tight to the ground on most of them, maybe foot and a half or two feet on some of the taller ones, but typically a nice compact uh, sun perennial. Delphiniums, other people call them larkspur, you know, kind of that classic English garden perennial. Um, most of them are blooming out late May, June. There's still some blooms hanging on. I see driving around. If we deadhead uh, the delphiniums a little bit here as they finish blooming in June without going to seed, we will tend to get a little bit more flowers coming up. This is usually a taller plant. Delphiniums, we can get up even into that four or five foot range. A lot of the newer ones are a little more compact, but that's one I certainly would consider perhaps staking or supporting a little bit uh, if we've got one of the taller ones for sure. The pastel colors on these, the lavenders, the blues, the purples, whites, pinks, um, the opposite of the other ones we've seen. We won't find a a real hot orange or yellow delphinium. There is one that's pretty close to red these days if you can find it, but uh, mostly the pastel colors. A couple of my favorites that I use in my yard, I love blanket flowers. You know, if you've got hot sun, you want something low under a foot, something that'll naturalize and create a nice border. I've probably got six or seven different blanket flowers in different hot, dry spots in my yard. Don't need a lot of water. This is a plant that's native down to the high desert, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, some some areas much, much warmer and drier than we are. Um, and they thrive, you know, it's one you don't have to water much. Um, I deadhead these all the time in July. Mine start blooming in June. They get cute little fuzzballs on them, little seeds that are real soft to touch, kind of fun. Uh, but I'll pull those off here for a month or two and then start letting them go to seed in September and October. And that way I've got some fresh plants. My patch gets larger. Um, everybody's happy that way. But a little deadheading will really keep these blooming strong. Uh, lots of orange, red, yellow on these. Those are going to be your colors depending on solid color, stripes, pinwheels. You can find a number of different good blanket flowers or galardias around as well. Uh, one flower, Gara, you know, has been a hugely popular here the last few years. Whites and pinks, some different foliages. We got short ones, we've got ones that are a little taller. Uh, that's probably at the top of the butterfly list as far as uh, pollinator favorites. Certainly the bees and everybody else will like it, but particularly butterflies. Um, that's a nice statement perennial if you want to mix it in. A uh, little bit more height typically on those. We don't maybe necessarily have to have them at the border, but something that'll give you a lot of flower power for the entire summer into fall if we've got hot sun and we've got good drainage would, would be a key with Gara. Uh, cranes build geraniums or hardy geraniums, not annual ones, um, but ones that again will naturalize pretty well. Uh, some lots of options for those and the pinks, the whites, the blues, the lavender tones. Um, great little cottage garden perennial that again 
It's going to give me a lot of flower power from late spring through the summer um, if I pick the right variety and again keep them a little deadheaded. This is one that'll sprawl out and cover some large area if you keep them watered. This one I wouldn't put on the drought tolerant side, one that we want to have a little bit regular water with and we'll have happy Cranesville geraniums. Uh, back to the orange, red, yellow again. We got some sneeze weed. Others call it Helen's flower. I kind of like the word sneeze weed and I'm an allergy guy. It doesn't make you sneeze that bad. So I have these in my yard too. Uh, Hellenium is a great summer to fall perennial. These are flowers a little bit smaller, nice compact upright plant, but those flowers on Helleniums will last you about three months. So when they open, I've got a lot of bees going on these. This is one of the favorites in my own yard for the bees uh, to be visiting on a daily basis. So uh, lots of options out there. I can do red, orange, yellow. Some of them have kind of the striping on them, multiple colors and some heights, you know, look at your different heights. I wanted mine more like in the two to three foot range. So I picked a different variety that I could keep back in the garden a little bit. There's other sneeze weeds that won't get more than a foot, foot and a half that we can perhaps use on the border as well. Uh, some sunflowers, you know, sunflowers are annuals up here, real big sunflowers, uh, but we do have perennial sunflowers. Look at the same plant, the same idea as a sunflower, not quite as big, but things that if we have good sun and good drainage that we can have uh, come back year after year after year. So look at some of the Helianthus or the Heliopsis. Those are both types of perennial sunflower, great for the pollinators. And again, long season of flower uh, from summer to fall. Some of these I can get very tall. You know, this is one uh, for me, I, I've used the Helianthus that grows up five or six feet. You know, if you want something at the back of the garden that I could stake up and have a big yellow bright sunflower type flower that will come back every year, Look at your height options. There, there'd be some nice tall ones as well to try, even double flower too. Uh, a couple of different ones here, Eupatorium. We call it Joe Pie Weed. That's one I like to put on here for wet. You know, maybe you struggle a little bit with drainage, a little bit wetter area. Um, Eupatorium is one that will take some wet. So maybe a little safer if you're, if you're concerned about drainage. Uh, we can do a couple of different heights on that. A tall Joe Pye weed gets pretty big and bushy and tall. We can also do Baby Joe. That's kind of a little smaller one. But again, a great summer bloomer, nice foliage, easy to grow, but just want to consider maybe if you're concerned about drainage a little bit more. Uh, Catmint or Nepeta has been a craze around here for years. I mean, that's one the bees are going berserk on out in the nursery right now, I can tell you. Uh, Nepeta continues to flower very heavy. Nice little low border plant, great for sun, good drought tolerance. Um, that's one where we can do kind of those bluey, lavender, you know, pinky tones. If you want a little softer color, and that's one that, again, blooms a long time. will take the heat and get you something nice and drought tolerant. Speaking of drought tolerance, there's your lavender. You know, this would be an evergreen perennial. Lavenders will keep their foliage year round. Um, but you've got lots of options for lavender. I could have put 50 on here again. Um, I put a couple of English on. You'll see English, you'll see French, you'll see Spanish. And I, I would mention with Spanish, if you have a lavender that blooms and has those two little rabbit ear flowers at the top, that's Spanish. I'd be much more concerned with drainage and winter time with Spanish. I might call some of those Spanish lavenders kind of that temporal really pretty flower, but make sure you've got good drainage and excellent sun, or, or they may struggle a little bit more than some of the French or the English. You know, again, whites, pinks, all different shades of purples, you know, come down and look at the lavender selection. We've got a great uh, crop of lavender in right now, um, and really could probably find one that'll catch your fancy. Some a little taller, some a little lower. Platinum blonde, you can see the other one on there. That's got variegated leaves. So if you like a cool foliage with the purpley flower on top, maybe consider platinum blonde. Um, the biggest trick with lavender is keep in mind prune after bloom. If you want nice, tight, you locals probably have made it over to the, the Squim Lavender Festival at some point or seen a lavender farm. You know, we got huge low pincushion plants that are covered in flower. That's pruning. You know, we want to make sure when flowers are dried, we shear those back to keep the plants low full and that'll keep them blooming multiple times a year as well. 
a Penstemon or Beer Tongue, another great one. Just kind of finishing at the end of bloom right now, but if you like something kind of for that late May, June, July time frame, uh, Beer Tongue or Penstemon will offer you quite a bit of options and colors and size and heights again. Um, you can see the shape of that flower. It's another great one for pollinators, nectar lovers, or all the above. So take a look at some of the penstemons around. Uh, Russian sage um, or, or Porofskia, that's always a tough one to say. Uh, Russian sage is one that, again, we would probably put at the drought tolerant top of the list uh, for pretty much any plant. That's a plant that uh, thrives in Siberia. So you can probably guess extremely cold hardy, extremely drought tolerant. Uh, one that will get a lot of that lavender blue flower on, silvery foliage, and a little bit more woody. That's kind of more of a woody perennial. I've seen Russian sage up five or six feet tall, you know, towards the end of a season. Other varieties, a little bit more dwarf in that two to three foot range. So, again, look at your options on varieties, but Russian sage may be a nice statement, maybe a specimen plant to use in the center of a perennial garden and then use some of these other things around it kind of thing. Uh, Cerrado stigma or plumbago, hardy plumbago. There's a lot of plumbagos that aren't hardy, but this one would be. This will give me a nice blue flower on a low, naturalizing, almost ground cover. This is a plant that really is a great late summer fall one that would be flowering and turning a bright crimson fire engine red at the same time on the leaves. So we walk out in September and see bright red foliage with that crisp blue flower on top is a nice combination on a perennial, a little bit different. Uh, Rubecki or Black Eyed Susan uh, is probably one of my favorites. I like old fashioned perennials, a few. These remind me of my mother and my grandmother, um, but it's a you know classic yellow daisy flower. This is one that's extremely drought tolerant. You know, be careful, I will say. This is one of the ones I use to naturalize. I put one in and it's gonna start creeping and I'll end up with a really nice patch it's easy to go back and divide, take some out if you get too much. But Black-Eyed Susan will give you a really nice yellow flower here most of the summer towards fall. Uh, a couple lots of varieties out there. Goldstrom is what's pictured there. I have that one in my yard, maybe a little bit taller, you know, up there a couple feet tall. If you don't want it, maybe quite as tall. There's lots of other options out there too. We'll, we'll see a couple of dwarfs back on our tables. Um, and certainly ones that maybe start a little bit earlier in the season if you want to get into June flower. Um, lots of good options of Rudbeckias. Uh, salvias is one of the, 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 again, most popular plants around the nurseries here the last couple, actually last few years here in Washington for sure. Um, you know, I would say there's some certainly hardy salvias. Um, there's a lot of salvias that go down to, you know, 20, 30 below zero plenty of options that go hardy for us in Western Washington. Other salvias that I would probably call temperennials. If I see that blue, purpley flower, like the Amistad, the black and blue, there's a zillion varieties out there. You know, those are ones I'm okay with as a gardener if they don't come back. If they do, great. If they don't, sweet, I'm gonna go grab another one because I'm gonna get more flower power out of that salvia than I will honestly most annual flowers. I can use it in a container, add it to my garden, really enjoy it. Uh, hopefully for years to come, but absolutely for that entire season till frost. Now the trick with salvias is always going to be drainage. Whether you have a super hardy one that goes down to 30 below or you've got one that's hardy to zero degrees, I have to have good drainage. I cannot be too wet, in, especially in the winter time when the salvias are going to struggle. So make sure they're high and dry. If you keep them fed, um, you'll get a lot of flowers out of the salvias entirely through the summer into the fall. Uh, sedums are always one, you know, that we have there on the drought tolerant list. Sedums and succulents are always the top where I don't need a lot of water once they're established. You know, I would always think of sedums, A, as great perennials for sun, rockeries, slopes, hot spots, containers even. Um, but look, think of them in three ways. You know, I can get real flat ground cover sedums, lots of options for those here at the nursery. The sun sparklers, I think, are some of the prettiest ones because they're just a little bit taller. They mound a little bit. I can get some great foliage color on those. Reds, you see the variegated one there. Uh, that's lime zinger. 
There's quite a few different options for sun sparklers. And then we can get upright. Maybe I want a little bit of height, you know, two or three feet tall. I can get something like Autumn Joy is the one pictured there. I can get dark leafed ones, green leafed ones, some different colored flowers, but I can almost achieve three different heights by mixing some different sedums in the garden. If you don't want to water, I use a lot of these in my south facing rockery. You don't water them much, they fend for themselves. And I always get great late summer, fall bloom. Most of the sedums are just coming into flower right now and will keep my bees extra happy all the way through into, into the fall with a, a multitude of different colors in my own landscape. So, so check out the sedums. A couple little different ones, uh, Achillea or Yaru, that's another butterfly favorite. Um, I put kind of the plum colored one on there, but Yaru or Achillea is a plant that I can get really nice silvery foliage on, nice clumpy growth habit and a lot of different colors. I mean, I could pick really any shade in the rainbow except for probably blue and orange and I can find a, a yarrow that will catch my fancy. So whites, yellows, reds, pinks, plums, all different options in there um, on different Achilles. Great for sun, nice drought tolerant. This, these are ones that in, in certain parts of Washington would be a wildflower. You would see that uh, growing up on the peaks, the mountains a little bit in Eastern Washington as one of our native wildflowers. Uh, Zauchneria is uh, one of my favorites because I love orange. I have one of these uh, planted on my driveway slope that just hangs and blooms and does its thing. It's been blooming for a month already. Uh, I have flowers on it all the way up to the fall. It doesn't get very tall. You can kind of see in the picture there, hanging off kind of a sunny wall. You heard me in my rockery. Again, the key with Zelchneria is drainage. I have to have good sun. I have to be dry as much as I can the winter and not get too wet. This is not one to plant above clay. If we have a nice slope like mine, I've had mine for years now. It just keeps slowly spreading. Probably got a three foot by four foot little carpet of orange flowers that hang in between some rocks all the way down to my driveway edge. And it gets cooked in the sun. Those are plenty happy with sun. But uh, that, that's a great one for the hummingbirds if you like the Zelchneria, the oranges and the reds. A few things for shade as we get into summertime here, anemones are just starting to pop open. Uh, typical Japanese anemones, whites, pinks. There's even some bluey lavender ones, but, but certainly some options for doubles, for singles, and for different heights. There's some shorter ones and some taller ones. So look at your anemones if you're trying to get that pollinator attraction, you know, going for the August, September into October timeframe. This would be a great late summer fall bloomer. Uh, take a look at anemones. That's one that'll naturalize, not a clumper. So if you've got part shade, you know, to shade, this is one we could pop some in and you'll see them seed out and probably have a bunch of anemones down the road. It's a great one to kind of let fill in and naturalize. Abesia uh, is a little evergreen perennial that'll keep its foliage. Nice little white short flower stock but that's one we could even use in deep shade. If you've got a woodland garden, looking for a nice uh, summer bloomer to keep the, keep the bees happy for deep shade, that's one you'll get some nice little light flowers on, but great foliage as well. Uh, so Mr. Fuga, I'll still call it that. Now they call it Actea, they're trying to rename it on us. I've heard it called snake root, all kinds of fun things. This is another one uh, we love here at the nursery and I've got in my own yard. Um, this is a little taller perennial. I'll probably get two or three foot of foliage. If I get a little bit of sun on it, I'll keep some purple on it and not so much green. You could almost plant this in sun, honestly, if you water it, it would need some water, but you could have this in more sun for sure to get the darker foliage. But really interesting flower, kind of looks like a big white snake that curls up the top and got great fragrance as well. This is one I've used in the shade. I've got another one out where it gets a pretty good chunk of sun that I get a little darker on the leaves. But certainly look at the Semisifugas. We've got some in now. It adds a little bit of that darker uh, purple burgundy foliage into the garden with a nice flower as well. Uh, love Aurelia. You know, I'm a yellow guy. If you've been to our classes, I can't have enough yellow foliage in my own yard. Um, I've got a couple of these Aurelias now. I went and looked this morning so I could tell you my original one's about four feet tall this year and about four feet across. And it looks like a shrub. It's hard to believe in the wintertime, it dies to the ground, disappears, and then boom, I pop back up in the spring. 
This is a plant we call Sun King, Gotemba. The biggest thing is, a, is ask for a golden Aurelia. It's a, it's a fabulous perennial for foliage. Blooms a little bit in the fall, gets a little purplish berry on it as well. But if I'm looking to glow, you know, if I've got shade, I'm going to have lime green, big leaves, nice big perennial. If I get a little dab of sun on it, I'm going to really glow that nice golden yellow color and be even brighter. So take a look at Aurelia. We got just got a bunch more in because it's one of our favorites for summer. That's a statement perennial, a good specimen. The fuchsias, you know, again, we've got lots of annual fuchsia, fuchsia options that would never live through the winter or hanging baskets, other things for, for pots. Hardy fuchsias are a plant that we can add to the garden in that shade, part shade, part sun a type situation, or even sun again, if, honestly, if they get enough water and really have a great one for the hummingbirds. The same classic, you know, Corolla and sepals. You can have all the different colors like you would see in annual fuchsias, but now we've got something that's pretty reliably hardy up here that we can grow as a perennial. They develop wood, you can plant them different heights, different colors, <clears throat> and certainly a lot of options, whatever your taste is, adding them into the garden. Uh, this is one, again, a good one for the pollinators and a, one you'll water a little bit. Hardy fuchsias will need some summer water. If you kept these, if you keep feeding these consistently, I put Seagro on my golden foliage fuchsia every two weeks during the summer. I've got nonstop flower and a beautiful specimen pot, specimen plant that I know will come back season after season after season. So take a look at the hardy fuchsias. You know, we probably average 15 or 20 varieties of these typically here in stock all the time. We've got a great selection uh, to come down and peek at. Hostas, you know, lots of hostas. If you like foliage, you like hostas. Nice flower, sometimes some fragrance on the flowers too, but you can really match a hosta foliage to your taste. I'm always psyched here in the spring at Sunnyside you know, we go back 25 years and we get the hosta of the year available for our customers going back 25 years. So the best of the best to me, greens, whites, blues, yellows, variegated, big, small, giant, everywhere in between. You know, we can find a hosta, frankly, for anybody's garden spot. Um, look at the heights, look at the foliage color, you know, get something that you like uh, for your own taste. But I think hosta makes a great specimen plant. They're very drought tolerant, which I think surprises a lot of people. Don't need a lot of water. And they're plants that can take a little bit more sun probably than you think. Certainly some need to be in more shade, but there's quite a few that will take a pretty good blast of sun and still give me the, the good foliage color that I'm looking for. A couple other ones, saxifrages, again, just about finishing right now. Uh, but some really good little saxifrage to add. Sun, part shade, shade, you can really grow saxifrage in a lot of different areas in the garden. Um, the saxifrage is one we can pick different foliage color, but typically a nice tight repeat flowering perennial. That one pictured there is part of the Turan series, T-O-U-R-A-N. We can do red, we can do pink. That's one I have in my own yard and I will tell you that little creature starts blooming in mid-March and I have flowers all the way into the middle of the summer. So that's another one, a little bit longer season of bloom for that particular variety. Uh, Thelictrum or meadow rue, this is a great one for shade if you want a little bit of height and some fragrance again. Um, I've seen these planted a lot in woodland gardens. I have a couple in one of my shady beds as well. Um, that's a plant, again, you can see the flower a little bit earlier in summer, not quite so now to fall but certainly a summer bloomer that will give you some, some happy pollinators and some butterflies will come see you too. Some last couple here, uh, some evergreen perennials. So spurge is one that we would have leaves all year, very drought tolerant, great for sun. We use them in pots quite a bit too. You can see some fabulous foliage. The Ascot rainbow is the one that's variegated there. There's all kinds of dark leafed ones, red tipped ones. These are ones that will bloom, uh, usually coming out late winter to spring, an interesting flower, uh, ones that will naturalize. If you let these go to seed, we can have spurge or euphorbia kind of popping up all over a sunny bed. If you've got good drainage, you've got good sun, spurge might be a good choice for you for an evergreen perennial. Some ferns, 
again, more for shade. We've got evergreen ferns and I put a perennial fern next to it. But again, good choices depending on your taste, if you want evergreen, or if you like a little splash of color, the little painted fern there called ghost, you know, will disappear in the winter, but that's got some great silver, some green, some different colors going on the fronds during the growing season to add a little bit of foliage. And then hellebores, you know, we're not even close to hellebore seasons, but we can't, I can't mention evergreen perennials without ever mention hellebores. That's one of my many plant addictions. Uh, you can see by the collage I put on there, every color in the rainbow. We're just starting to get hellebores back in here for fall. A plant you will see a, a massive selection of options around fall, winter to spring. But I would always have winter, spring flower, evergreen foliage, good drought tolerance. They take shade. They take more sun than you probably think. Um, but hellebores is one I'd really consider adding in. That would be a great one to help keep the pollinators happy coming out of winter with flower, but have a nice evergreen uh, perennial for some presence in the winter as well. Uh, hookeras is another one for me. I got hookeraitis. That's the addiction to all things hookera. I couldn't tell you how many are in my own yard. We use a bunch of these here in the nursery and pots and landscapes. I could pick any color in the rainbow and I could find a cool hookera foliage that catches my eye. I put a couple on there, Fire Chief, it's the one with the red, uh, berry marmalade, forever purple. There's a lot of really good purple ones the other side there. Um, but again, I want evergreen, a little clumpy perennial. It gets a nice flower on it for the bees. The hummingbirds actually like them as well. Um, it's certainly something I would consider adding. That's a great border plant that will give you something evergreen and some good foliage color. So that's the end of the slideshow there. You can see on that slide our internet address. We've got some great information um, on our perennials page. Lots of pictures you can look at. The handout is there as well on the class page if you did not get it. Email us anytime. I'm guessing the Whistler got a lot of questions during class for us. Um, but certainly I'm here all weekend if you want to email some questions to me or the staff or certainly stop down. We'd be happy to help you. So give me one second. Get you back on the screen here. All right, there we go. We'll stop the screen share. So let me just tell you a couple things. Um, you know, we did a lot of summer today and I've mentioned a couple times, you know, we can find a perennial for any time of the season. So don't forget about spring, for winter, fall. You know, we'll have a perennial class a little later in August that we'll talk about some grasses and some fall blooming perennials. Um, but there's certainly a perennial for every, every season of the year. Um, I want to show you a couple of things I mentioned, you know, the fertilizer, you can see that this is EB Stone, I think the best organic company, we carry all their fertilizers and soils here, EB Stone Rosen Flower Foods, a great perennial fertilizer, if you want to go with something granular, like I mentioned earlier, I would be out doing a rim around most of my perennials, I do that in March, I tend to go back and do it one more time early summer, especially if it's summer bloomer, um, as kind of a maintenance thing. If I'd rather do something water soluble, you know, try what we use here at the nursery. Seagrow is something I can put in my watering can and go give a little bit of foliar feed, plus feed the root systems and really keep things growing and blooming strong. So we still got some great uh, Seagrow around. You know, I if you keep your pruners sharp, we talked about deadheading. Certainly pruners are easy to use. I use my Felcos at home, but I, a lot of times, I got big hands and these were not my favorite tool, but I've gotten used to them. Little snips, you know, this is one made by Dram, sharp as nails, really easy to go in and do a little bit of deadheading without having to mash uh, the stems or, or keep it tidy. So consider getting a little pair of snips. And I'm sure someone's gonna ask at some point, so I'm gonna bring this up now, dividing and transplanting. So we get towards the end of the season here, after we get frost, Perennials are very easy to dig up, relocate. If you're like me and your garden evolves every season and you're not quite happy with it there and you want to move two feet that way, that's the time of year we want to do transplanting or dividing. I've, we got old clumps of hosta that I do. Stick a shovel to it, divide it into pieces, leave one, move a couple to another area, share them with gardening friends. Perennials very, very easy to divide on a lot. I'll show you the, the tool we keep around this is kind of a Conan the Barbarian weapon. If you look at that, very sharp, 
It's even got a blade on the end. Don't be careful with that on the toes. But uh, these are a shovel series called Root Slayer. And I'm telling you, when you get to digging things up or you want to divide a perennial, you stick your boot on that and shove it down a clump of perennials. You're going to divide stuff very easy in the wintertime. You can do the square one, or they finally have just put out this year the round version as well. So I've got a, a sharp edge if I got to cut a root if I'm digging something out, but I've got the same blade and a very sharp edge that I can jump on and do some really easy dividing. So it's not a cheap tool, but I'm telling you, if you're a good gardener and you like to move things and divide them like me, it's worth the money. That's a really good shovel to have in the garage for specific projects like this, okay? Uh, tomorrow I'll be in here uh, doing class on nativars, so kind of derivatives of natives at 11 a.m. If you want to join us, we'll have the, the same, a, a different class going here tomorrow. With the classes, you know, we always have discounts here for our local customers. We'd love to see you come down and do some shopping. This is a really easy one. All the perennials on the property are 20% off through next Friday. So you simply tell our cashier when you check out, I was at the class with Trevor online. They hit a magic button in our register system. You've got 20% off your perennials this week. That's a great savings. Come down. We've got a really good selection uh, going here for summertime. Um, our next class here at the nursery after tomorrow um, is a couple weeks away on August 14th. We'll have living wreath class. It will be recorded. It's kind of a project class. It will be posted that Saturday morning at 10 a.m. You can watch it anytime. It's a really fun class if you want to make a a sedum wreath or a, a fun little a, a fun little uh, sedum type project. Uh, Holly and Sarah, our two greenhouse uh, maestros, will be going through some pretty fun projects with that. That's a fun class uh, if you want to jump on there. Um, I hate to tell you, but I'm I get a couple weeks at home with my children, so I'll be gone here for a couple weeks on vacation, but I'll be back teaching class the last weekend in August. So the Saturday, the 28th of August. We will have our fall grasses and fall perennial class. So you'll see me back here live a little bit later this month. And we've got a great class selection uh, set up through September, October, November. Uh, take a look on the website as well, okay? So let's go with some questions and we'll see how Ben's doing. I'm not sure how the chat was going, but we can do some questions here. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, yeah, Trev, we got a couple questions. Uh, I've had several here about uh, deer resistance um, or if there's even any sort of perennial that would actually repel deer. That would actually be what? Uh, would repel deer, like repel beyond deer. resistance. Um, not so much repel. Um, deer is always a funny one. I mean, I wish I could memorize everything on earth, but well, the first thing I would do, if you're local here in Western Washington, Go on your Google search and type in Pacific Northwest, Western Washington, deer resistant plants. There's always a great list in the Sunset, um, in the Sunset Western Garden Book or look online. A lot of the websites, the Conservation District, Native Plant Society, there's a bunch that will show you a huge list of options for not just perennials, but trees and shrubs um, and other goodies too. Uh, very good. Um, we mentioned about dividing uh, plants for perennials. Can you also propagate any of those via cuttings? Yeah, some, you know, you can, you can propagate most anything. Uh, we won't tell the plant police if it has a patent on it, you're not supposed to propagate it, but we'll keep, we'll keep quiet. Um, if you want, you know, the, the best way to do it, probably if you haven't started, it might be a little bit late this year, unless you've got somewhere you can shelter it here as we get into fall. But you get some rooting hormone. We've got rooting hormone here at the store. You know, get a really well-drained potting soil. We've got that. You know, you could take some cuttings of quite a few things and get them to root. Um, specific plants, you know, have, have specific needs a little bit with, with propagation. But the majority of things, very, very easy to, to take a cutting and get rooted. Uh, very good, Trev. I have another one. Let me pull it up here. Um, bee bomb. Uh, yep. I'm assuming it's it's great to attract bees. Uh, yep. Does it also attract um, hummingbirds? Well, I mean, I, I would say it's not going to. It's usually more butterflies and bees with bee balm. Um, there's not quite as much nectar in there for the hummingbird. But um, actually, I can't believe you brought that up because I'm shocked I didn't put it in my slideshow. I have that as well. But lots of good bee balms. 
Um, probably the one thing I would say up in Washington is be real careful um, with powdery mildew, um, just to be brutally honest. Bee balm is one. The newer varieties are much more resistant. Um, I have a new purple one that I haven't had to fight mildew um, as much on. Um, but some of the old school ones, if, if we get too much shade or we overhead water, especially in the evening or at night, um, you might fight a little bit of mildew on them. Um, we have a question here about uh, penstemons. Um, mm -hmm. It looks like someone deadheaded them and they don't seem to be reblooming. Is that normal? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. Most penstemon, um, I, I didn't mention that when I showed it either, is it's just, it's not one that I'll probably get a lot of repeat flowering on. Um, you know, if you want that kind of look and a little bit more upright, the penstemon's got a little different shaped flower um, with the nectar. It's a great one for, the, again, the pollinators, but probably a little bit shorter window of flower. The salvias would probably give you, a, again, a little taller stalk type flower that probably would repeat maybe a little bit easier, longer in the summer. Um, we mentioned a fertilizer for hardy fuchsias. I, I didn't yeah. catch it. Um, what was the one we said? Well, it's a, it, it'd be the same food. I mean, uh, you know, for me again, I always try to use me as an example. You know, I've got that big golden foliage one in a container in my shade garden that I love as a specimen. I have other ones in the ground in shade gardens in the spring. I always start out with that EB Stone fertilizer. If I remember to go back in June, maybe I throw that down or some Ultra Bloom from EB Stone, another organic phosphorus that keeps the bud in bloom. But that, the one in the container especially, is one that I feed every couple of weeks with the Seagro. You know, I want maximum flower and nice growth. I mean, mine is cut down to probably about a foot of wood coming out of winter. It's already two and a half feet by two and a half feet. By the end of the fall, I'll probably have a three and a half foot by three and a half foot hardy fuchsia with flowers on it until we get a, a good hard frost. So try, you know, as a water soluble, if that's easier, you see grow, you know, every couple of weeks, even once a month would be would be okay. If you want to do a granular, stick with that rose and flower food for maybe stone. Um, one just popped up here. Uh, how big of a container do you have your uh, big golden hardy you fuchsia can. in? Uh, mine's about, you know, I kind of stick with the 18 to 24 inches wide, maybe not quite as deep on most of my planters like that. Um, it's my, the one that mine's in. It's probably year six now, and at some point I'll get my root slayer out and divide it and put a piece back in and move something to another spot in the yard. It'll get root bound. But if you add something, you know, 18 inches, two feet across, you know, 16, 18 inches deep, that's plenty to keep a hardy fuchsia happy for a number of years. Uh, one just popped up, uh, I'm gonna try to pronounce this, Zaka Gerinias, Z-A-U-S-C-H-N-E-R-I-A-S. Zaka. Maybe have them. Have them email it so I can check All it out. Right. Maybe have them mail it down. Yeah, I'll check it out. Um, Seagro we use for the whole growing season. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, again, it, you know, all plants are going to go dormant in the winter. So, you know, if you got out there starting, you know, probably mid-April or so, if you were going to get on a water-soluble schedule, got that in the habit, and we probably stopped doing it, you know, maybe mid-September, early October, let, let things start to kind of settle down for fall, go dormant, and then we'll see you again next year. Uh, Trev, I, I think we're going to wrap it up here. i got a couple more I'm going to answer real quick. And then uh, if anyone else has questions, just send us an email, uh, sunnysidenursery at msn.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow uh, for the Nativar class. It's kind of a fun one to have some discussion on, but uh, thanks for joining us. Get out there and work in the yard. It's a little overcast. It's not cooking yet today. It's supposed to be out this afternoon, uh, but it feels nice and a little bit cooler today. So uh, get out and get some work done, everybody. Remember, leaves up and roots down. All right, we'll see you tomorrow.